Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this PARSE event, Never Off Work. Um, my name's Kirstine MacDonald, and I'm welcoming you on behalf of the uh, PARSE Research Arc Art and Work ed editorial uh, team, uh, which includes uh, Dave Beach, who's a professor at Valand and an artist, Marina Vishmit, lecturer at Goldsmiths in London, uh, whose research is concerned with the value of art um, and labour with an emphasis on speculative relations. Um, Marina's sitting to the side over here. Uh, my other colleague is Ben Fallon, sitting on the other side in the front row. Uh, ben and myself are both independent curators based in Glasgow in Scotland, um, and we're founding members of an organisation called Chapter 13, which is a cooperative of curators that we set up to try and address some of the conditions of maintaining a practice uh, over a period of time and also looking at sort of systemic problems with independent practice and work uh, within the context uh, we're located in. Um, under Dave's stewardship we've been discussing, reading and commissioning work around this research arc over the past six or seven months. Uh, with a broad set of responses to the themes that are set out. Um, I know that Dave's introduced the, the um, theoretical background to this research arc at previous events at Valand, so I don't want to spend a long time talking uh, to, that, um, to that overview. But um, I'd summarise by saying that we are looking at regarding ways in which art is represented um, sorry, in ways in which work is represented through art and art systems, as well as contemporary discourse on art as work within a wider economic and political discussion. Today's contributors at the event are thinking about what, um, where the work of making art takes place, what kind of work supports the making of art, and how the workplace is built both as a physical entity and as a notional space of processes that can be internalized and externalized uh, by our bodies aligned with such handheld devices. When the new PARSE website launches, which will be early in the new year, and well, previously we had the homepage up, um, so you can get hold of the new web address, um, a number of the works which we'll hear snippets from today will be published on that forum. They've been drawn from an open call and a commissioning process. Um, the dual processes that represent how we as editors have drawn together the material that will be pre presented today. We only have, well, now just under three hours together and a lot of people to hear from. Um, so I'd like you to regard this event as more of an introduction to the fuller reflections which will be published online uh, in the months to come. Uh, the journals moved away from a printed format, so that means that the art and work research uh, material will be located online, um, and we hope to culminate this um, body of new material in a further event in May next year, so I hope you'll be able to join us then. So just to give you an introduction to the structure of today, this afternoon's event, um, we'll have two 20-minute uh, presentations, uh, one from Karen Hansen, and another from Felicity Allen. Um, both are artists and researchers. And um, then my colleague Ben will introduce the screening program. We have a program of around one hour's uh, material um, by a number of artists, some of whom are also available uh, after the screening for further discussion. Um, Immediately after the screening, we'll um, have a presentation from Jenny Richards, who's half of Manual Labours, who have just published a new manual, a hard, uh, handbook um, called Body as Building. Building as Body. I should have written it down. Um, and uh, Jenny will give an overview to that project, and the publication's also available here. It was launched last month in Nottingham Contemporaries, so uh, it's the first chance to have a look at it um, in your hand uh, here in Sweden. Um, and then after those presentations, we'll have hopefully around an hour left, or just under an hour, 
for a wider discussion with yourselves, um, with uh, two of the artists from the screening program, um, Winnie Herbstein from Glasgow and uh, Bjorn Perberg, who's based an hour north of Gothenburg. Um, I won't introduce everyone with a formal biography. We've put together a sheet with a little bit of information for you, for each speaker. But because we're short of time, we'd like to just get straight into the presentation. So I'd like to introduce Karen Hansen, um, who will uh, make the first presentation today. Thank you. Okay, I, this thing is on because I can feel my, oh, hear myself breathing. So it's. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, I can start anyway without uh, the slides. Uh, my name is Karin Hanson, and I'm an artist and uh, also researcher, um, both at the Royal Institute of Art in Stockholm and at uh, Stockholm University right now at the gender study department. Um, and I have um, a PhD in um, computer and system science, but it was like a pilot project just the year before the artistic research school started. So it was like a collaboration between the Royal Institute of Art and the computer and system science department. Uh, and yeah, I think that these projects actually started um, in this, um, uh, between these two institutions, because they're very different. The, the Royal Institute of Art is one of the older, most prestigious institutions in um, Stockholm and Sweden in the arts. And uh, the Computer and System Science Department, um, I think it started in the 60s, 70s. So it's one of the youngest institutions at Stockholm University and also the largest. There are over 5,000 students. Uh, and they're also situated in, in you know, two places. Um, the, the Royal Institute of Art is in the center and uh, the, the Computer and System Science Department is in Shista, Rinkibi Shista, which is like in the suburb. And, um, so, and I will talk about um, a project um, called Artist Salary Now, uh, that is a collaboration between me and, and some artists and musicians, uh, and which is also is an, uh, part of a ar larger art, um, artistic research project financed by the Research Council in Sweden. Um, can I? So. Uh, and uh, yes, yeah, so these are these two institutions. Um, I mean, you PhD uh, in sort of in art. I think I, I was at the junior art yesterday talking with uh, PhD students there, and they all are so focusing on on the, their identity as artists and researchers and how to sort of combine these these two. Um, contradictions uh, somehow. And uh, that's also the same for me, that I was very focused on, on the role of the artist, uh, spent years just looking into art sociology, and uh, even created um, a small uh, reputation mechanism just based on uh, the sort of art system and how it functions. So now you know, I have... Um, I know it all, this is a system, if you wonder, you can just... <laughs> Uh, I can send it to you. Uh, and I did other things that had uh, about this commodification of, of different relations uh, to do, like the system that is merged between um, like a social network and uh, online trading as a way to um, be able to sort of transfer relations becoming commodities and, and enabling new forms of um, relations. So you, you can have like an, an extended family that you actually have a, a, a real contract with. So I'm really interested in how, how do you can sort of translate uh, work, different type of relations to systems uh, to enable, you know, trading your friends and so uh, and this was part of, of another uh, um, project we called Performing the Common. It was a large collaboration between a, a lot of artists. I want to talk about that. That's the background to 
uh, this work, work uh, that is like a three-year uh, research project. We, we, um, the aim is to explore the renegotiation of the concept of work. And we're interested of, of two different things. One is globalization and new media and, and what that means uh, for different types of work relations. And also the, the role of the artist. Um, is this an attempt to avoid capitalism or, or is the artist a perfect worker that is self-motivated, passionate about the work, creates your market, um, exploit their whole life as an artwork? Uh, and you can read more about that here. And in, as part of this uh, project, um, one of the artists, Per Hasselberg, he is uh, also, I don't know how to translate, Verksamhetsledare for Konstfrämjandet. It's an organization for art in, in um, Sweden. Uh, and he were one of the, uh, and this I don't know how to say, remiss instance. What is that in English? Anyway, it's... Um, uh, uh, a government report by Swedish artist conditions that just came out and it's under discussion now and uh, basically it suggests that um, in order to solve different problems uh, for the arts uh, we'll take around well, 225 millions and, and from one part of the budget to another part and, and 100 uh, millions should go to digitalisering, digitalization. Uh, to, to teach uh, artists to be better at selling their works online and to protect their rights. So, and this is going to go to Tillväxtverket. It's a... Ah, the Growth Institute, yeah. And it's the, the department that... In a, yeah, for, for growing companies. Ah. So, so taking that money from the arts to the economy to teach artists to be better companies, basically. Uh, so we thought this was hilarious. And um, Pad then suggested that he think that maybe we should discuss another way of, of solving the problems that they... Because there are a lot of problems. Uh, for example, the poor social security of the artist. Uh, the uneven recruitment to artistic professions. Um, older artists often have very low pensions. Uh, difficulties for artists to establish across the whole countries. And also the challenges of digitization. Um, and then Per suggested, why don't we suggest uh, an artist salary instead? And I thought that was a really bad idea. You know, just the idea of a basic income for artists. You know, I'd, I don't know really why I thought it was a really bad, bad idea, but um, just, yeah. But, but I also thought it was really interesting because I felt such an unease uh, just by the thought of a, an artist's salary. Um, and then we have also had, um, this is Per on the right, and also Andrzej Broms, which is another uh, colleague of mine. That, um, and we also happen to have this uh, space, uh, Tegen 2 in Stockholm, which is a small uh, artist-run um, gallery. And this was just um, when we had the election a couple of months ago. And I also had this urge on need to do some kind of alternative posters to all the... Um, uh, the this political propaganda. Um, so I wanted to do um, an alternative poster. So, so we, we thought, okay, why not? Let's start a campaign for artist salary uh, and see what that could lead to. And um, so we started to sort of formulate what, what that, how that could look like, what, what type of argument and, and how, how can we sort of... Um, sort of, yeah, you know, um, find the, the right argument, you know, pitch for this idea. So that was easy uh, translated on um, this type of... Um, and uh, in, we used exhibition space to, to um, put this up. And we had one room that were like pro, uh, where we just collected different arguments for an artist salary. And then we had like the dark room where we collected 
uh, negative aspects of this. Um, uh, and uh, this is a space we um, had a print shop, an opening, and we have had like a month of discussions with different um, artists, politicians, um, researchers, uh, etc., to sort of develop this idea and, and discuss it. Uh, how many here know about uh, universal basic income and what? Okay, half the room. So then I'm happy I actually summarized it. And universal basic income, um, to simplify it, it's about equalizing income differences. Uh, it's also about reducing the bureaucracy of the welfare state. Um, it should be paid to everyone. It's not a negative income tax, but it's more like we have in Sweden um, barnbidraget. Um, what is that? That's like the child. We get like a support. Yeah, no, it's not a tax. You, you get like you, a child benefit. Everyone get like th thousand crowns per child, I think. And then you have money. Many you have an extra. Uh, and even if you're rich, you get this. So. And it's a way of, of uh, simplifying a bureaucracy, a reduced bureaucracy. Uh, and this is the same idea with the basic income set, that you, everyone is getting it, even though you have a lot of money. So it's, you don't have to, you don't need so much uh, bureaucracy. And it's also about increasing the individual's freedom of choice. So this is a very sort of liberal idea. Um, and uh, also to compensate for the shortcomings of a, of a capitalist system. Um, and there are, of course, a lot of arguments against it. Uh, the, the strongest may be very strong here in Sweden, actually. It's, a, the, it's, it's like a no question in Sweden, because, um, because of the work ethic in Sweden, the Arbetslinjen, I don't know how to translate that, really. I call it just work ethic. Yeah, but it's something that everyone has... It is, but it's, it's like all, also the socialists have sort of, and also the artists, we have everybody sort of, sort of uh, taking this idea up. Yeah, it could be from him, but it's used all over the place now, I think. Uh, so it's, it's not also by the artists, actually, um, or the artist organizations. Um, I don't know if they use the term, but they, they use the arguments. Um, and... Um, yeah, that it's, and, and the uh, arguments are like it's unfair to people who work, that some people actually just get money for not working, um, and that the motivation to work would diminish, uh, which in the end would collapse the finances and we wouldn't have that much to share. Uh, then we have the socialist arguments that, that the negotiation power uh, versus the capital owners um, should, um, you know, shouldn't be there anymore. Uh, the risk of wage dumping, and also that if it's compensated for the shortcomings of the capitalist system, um, you know, what's the point? It shouldn't it be better to, to just skip the whole capitalist system to start with? Uh, the feminist argument is that um, the basic income, it comes now when we have a, a crisis uh, among male workers, mainly. We still have a lot of work to do in society. The problem is that we don't pay for it. Um, and, and that this type of, of uh, support could uh, then uh, support traditional gender work divisions. Uh, and, and we have a similar ar arguments against artist salary, um, that artists should compete, should be like the best. Artists should be, have the most of the money. Uh, and art should be just like any other work. And this is how Koiru uh, et cetera is is sort of working politically for the artists that, uh, you know, if you exhibit on a museum, you should have like a, a real good fee for that and so on. So when you work and you sort of achieve something that is tangible and can be measured, then you'll get money. Uh, and also the socialist um, document that this could be some kind of wage dumping. Um, and that artists uh, are part of the precariat we should maybe join forces with the global precariat instead of 
of sort of supporting just for our own, our own group. Um, and against that, um, you can say that well, artist salaries, we already have artist salaries in Sweden. There are none. There are no artists that can support themselves without support from the state. Might, might be some few that have an international um, career somewhere. Uh, and, and they have maybe some year where they actually can survive on their art on a on sort of open market. But we don't have that type of market in Sweden. It's, it's just a big state supported. But we pretend as if it's a market. So we give the money to the institutions so they can pay their artists that are competing on like this kind of um, state state supported market. Um, the bureaucracy would decrease. There are so many different supports and it takes so much time, as we all know, to, to apply for all these different uh, project money. Um, we suggest that it should be like some kind of peer review system uh, that also could develop the art. Because if you have artists that is also um, judging who is going to be an artist, it will develop the art. Um, and we also think that artists must claim their own worth. Um, the value should not be set by a market. Um, an artist's salary can reduce the power of institutions like um, creators, critics, etc. And uh, this could also contribute to changes in the norms about w work and, and um, also a way to appropriate the concept of work. Because uh, in the end, we actually want an artist's salary for everyone. A salary to allow for time to take care of our commons and our existential issues. A modest salary based on the modest needs of artists. And unlike a universal basic income, it actually is intended for special specific purpose, our shared society. And since we claim that society is an art, it is up to each one of us to define what society is. Thank you. Okay, So I'll introduce our next speaker while the technology gets put into its place. Um, this is Felicity Allen, who's an artist and writer um, based in the UK, who has uh, an extensive history of working um, within higher and gallery education, um, including a period at Tate Britain where she ran the interpretation and education department from 2003 to 2010. Um, her recent research has um, been of interest to me particularly because it looks at the idea of the erasure of discourse around um, radical arts practice that fed into a gallery education context, specifically in the UK, um, that hasn't really been addressed by the focus on the, curatorial uh, the, the educational term within curatorial practice. I just uh, realised that I'm in trauma about Brexit, basically. So I'm trying to I'm trying to bring English British time here, which is why I'm so late. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm I've written an article for for the for the journal 
And I'm not, I'm actually going to read from something that is distinct from that, and I'll just give you a little bit of introduction to it. It comes into the, into the article, but it's a separate work, and really, it's a, it, it, from my perspective, it's an artwork. Um, I was doing some work um, about a, a concept that I've developed, which is called the deserver. So a deserver is basically um, a different version of an oeuvre. So some of you will know, if you're my generation, you'll certainly know the, the word oeuvre, in the French word oeuvre, which is used about an artist's entire work. And historians use it in this way. Do you know it? Yeah, okay. So a deserver is what I argue probably the majority of us do, and certainly I would say that women of my generation certainly have tended to produce deservers rather than oeuvres. And I can tell you a bit more about that. We can talk about it a bit more. But I hope some of it will come across. This is um, from this work that I made to explore this. In the late 1970s, when I emerged from, as an un, having done my undergraduate degree, um, I was involved in setting up something called the Women Artists Slide Library, because quite literally, until that point, we had been told that there were no, there'd never been any women artists, and I wonder why not. And, and during the 70s, um, luckily, some women started to research and find that actually there had been women artists, some of whom you saw pictured just then. Um, and so um, some of us got together to try and s s sort of argue back, really, um, and to make... Uh, well, the, there was always this other thing, which was that even if you did find a woman artist, she was never good enough. So there was always those kind of things going on as well. So we set up this thing called Women Artists Slide Library. The slide library started off as something in my flat, because I had a, a cheap flat with room in it. And, um, and various people had tried to start this thing before and hadn't really managed, but what they'd got was a second-hand filing cabinet, an ancient table, and a few slides in the, in the slide filing cabinet. So they passed them my way, they stayed in my flat, and then eventually we found a place, if you know London, there's a place called Battersea Art Centre, which is in southwest London, and it's, uh, it had a, basically a big cupboard under the stairs, which they said we could use as an office and, uh, and as the library. So everything moved out except for the table, the table stayed with me because it was too big for this cupboard under the stairs. So I made this work which combines the idea of the deserver and the what I've called the wazzle table. So the wazzle table is the women artists' slide library table. So I'm just going to read aspects of the work and I'm going to show you other aspects on the thing at the same time. This is obviously extremely ambitious. Um, and we'll have to see if it works. So I w the, what you'll see here, so this is a series of 15... Ah, this is an important thing I need to just introduce before you start looking at that, really. The, I, made a I started off by making a series of 15 prints um, of, for this series about the, the Wazzle Table, the Deserver Wazzle Table series. And then I kept on wanting to change it. And then I realized that actually part of the work was the idea of contingency and variation and, and making works that you could stand by and you'd felt, right, that was a work in itself, but then actually you wanted to vary it. So I used the... Initially, I was using the idea of version, but then I thought, actually, it's more like a variation in the musical terminology. So I decided I would limit myself to 27 um, variations. And so far, what you're seeing today is the sixth. And this variation is going to come out as a small artist book in the new year. Um, there's, a oh God, there's a series of prints, and there's also another... Um, 
um, version, variation, I should say, in, um, in an obscure academic journal that I've never come across before called Visual Resources. Uh, it's in the latest issue, should you hot, want to hot foot it to the library. So, um, and it's called an argument in four voices. And the four voices are the photography, the voice underneath, which is uh, the, the sort of album diaristic type voice. And then there's a very didactic vo voice. And then there's quotations from other people, which are the voices that circulate and inform my thinking. Um, the didactic voice changes its pronoun all the way through. And one of the things that I discovered that if you change the pronoun, of course what you do is you go from objective to subjective. So it weaves in and out of these different um, objectives and subjective. Right, that's enough introduction, I think. So, um, people positioned as peripheral to the production of culture have to work socially and institutionally, as well as in the studio, in order to make work, to change the structures, to allow them in, and to educate others to help make their work first visible and second enduring. Fourth voice. 1965. The art world is a very tight little world. It has capital investments such as dealers' galleries, dealers' stocks, artist studios, and their stock of work. The artist has contracts to galleries and responsibilities such as wives, children, mistresses. That's Gustav Metzger. Uh, next one. God, this is difficult. Ah, I see what I've done. I'm trying to... Okay. Phew. So the didactic voice, the third voice. You also have to earn a living as the market is only exceptionally open to you. It had seemed that everyone was educated to think that the rare women with careers were generally to be pitied, their work a poor substitute for women's true vocation of having children. Instead, you might take one of three intermittent or multiple jobs, depending on class and colour. Teacher or dinner lady or cleaner, secretary or clerk, typist or cleaner, nurse or not nursing auxiliary or cleaner, or factory worker, or cleaner. 1975. When I began working in art in 1948, I was married and had to fit my hours into a schedule of shopping, cooking, house cleaning, entertaining, and very often moving from city to city. In 1955, I had my first child, followed by two more, in 1958 and 1960. By 1961, when my work suddenly became clear before me and totally peremptory, I had a large and complicated setup within which I had to operate. Hmm, that's annoying, isn't it? Sorry. Uh, that last. That last bit that you can't really read says. Battersea Art Centre in 1982, the filing cabinet and slides went, but the table remained with me. So, didactic voice number three. Some of us were taught to be adaptable, prepared to proxy through others the aspiration we'd been trained in. Our children, perhaps, or our partners, our bosses, or our professors. We'd bend our thinking to accommodate the desires or inflections of others, or take extra, on extra jobs, maybe studying or working at home at night. Not everyone in the margins was trained this way. Distinctions of gender, class, colour might result in being trained in intransigence, mirroring the unswerving convention recognised as discipline that identified the oeuvre-producing white male artist. 2008. And this is Griselda Pollock. I'll give you the names first. I think it will work better. Um, Griselda Pollock. As a series of interlocking practices of making, analysis, historical revision, theoretical expansion, and astute and continuing analysis of ever-changing socio-political and cultural situations in which we work, over-determined by forces beyond ourselves, 
Feminist work is transgressive of existing institutions and structures in which it nonetheless has to intervene and to which it should make a radical difference. And this one, just to finish off that bottom bit. So it says, Hilary Robinson, Pauline, possibly me, while Pauline put together a one-day conference. So the third voice. With a disproportionate likelihood that she won't be adopted by a commercial gallery, she takes a job to earn a living, maybe in a gallery, a museum, or a school of art. Her practice necessarily extends, therefore, to cultural intervention in her institutional in employment. She works educationally to help her colleagues learn and strategically to, charge, to change how this institution imagines and deals with the people it marginalizes. These employments may have a built-in obsolescence born of an intransigent and unreflexive dominant culture. So the fourth voice, 2011, and it's Naima J. Keith, who's an American um, art historian. Dr. Samela S. Lewis is a visual artist and pioneer in the field of art history. In 1969, she became education coordinator at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, an opportunity she pursued because she wanted to create new exhibition opportunities for African-American artists. She fought vigorously for the hiring of more African-Americans by the museum, but after more than a year of constant conflict and disappointment, she resigned. Third voice. Sometimes one is the agent of a practice that leaks between two different roles. This may be an intended critical position. Real works of art may hide within a form of institutional employment. This may also relate to changes in working practices from standard employment contracts to one's, in one's early career to increasingly precarious or feminized labor. Adaptability starts to override obsession to characterize the artist. Possibilities for swerving a practice into institutional work develop as, for instance, public employers corporatize and switch from recruiting anonymous public servants to self-branded artist curators. 2015, and this is Cobaina Mercer about Stuart Hall. Only a prismatic aesthetic could do justice to a life that produced not just one identity, but several. My departures look like failure, and so does my exclusion. My work looks inconsistent. Clichés insinuate themselves. I am a minor artist, maybe a failed artist. Worse, not even a real artist. Falsely amateur, working alone in the dark for the love of it. Losing jobs, I lose colleagues. Having babies, I lose consistency. I lose my professional network. I can't find my artistic peer group. I am individualized as failing. It is not political. It is personal. 2005. This is Lubaina Himid, who some of you might know uh, won the Turner Prize in Britain this year. Did we let it go? That, so she wrote this in 2005. Did we let it go? Did we think we had won? Why did we invisibilize each other? What was the strategy? Did the women write enough? Why did we trust the Arts Council? We created something, named it, and then allowed it to be unnamed and thus defunded. It certainly does not exist now. All of us destroyed it. We cannot revisit it except as a dead thing to worship or be nostalgic about. While politically marginalized artists might argue for established artistic practice and institutions to adapt, their marginalization is internalized. They question their artistic authority since the work comes out of different places and doesn't add up to a conventional oeuvre. In 2014, Claudia Rankin, the American poet, wrote, sitting there, staring at the closed garage door, 
you are reminded that a friend once told you there exists the medical term, John Henryism, for people exposed to stresses stemming from racism. They achieve themselves to death trying to dodge the build-up of erasure. I'll just read you the bottom bit of that. The blue chair tucked under the table. Nick Bodymead, Chris McHugh and I started the Want Club. Third voice. We leave our work unclaimed as art. Fourth. This is Samella Lewis in 2017. Looking back, I'm not proud of anything I did, really. Samella Lewis, who we already heard mentioned, she's a black American nonagenarian artist and art historian. Looking back, I'm not proud of anything I did, really. I don't get proud. I just do what I have to do, and it happens, and then I go to the next thing. Compiling those books about black artists and writing the art history of African-American art wasn't done for career objectives. It was a necessity. Oh, damn it. Oh, I knew that would happen. It's okay. I'm all right. Excellent. Um, mm, Just so, yeah, you can read that. Um, Repeated self-assertion seems to result in art historians, curators, and critics noticing you, which may mean that your work goes on to occupy the archive. However, without a name for the deserver, you are unlikely to persist in self-assertion since you fear others will simply see your comings and goings, your shifts of direction, as flotsam and jetsam. 2018, Janice Chedi, who is a British writer, despite countless house moves and an international relocation, the British registration document miraculously remains in your possession 40 years later. You will in time become the good immigrant, documented, educated, and resilient. The post-colonial condition you will spend your adult life writing about, displacement, doubleness, and loss, will in 2018 become an embodied physical crisis. You will be unhomed within the only place that you have known as home. Even the most intellectually sensitive people can reinforce marginalizing divisions, for instance, based on the age of people one teaches art to, or whether one is a curator, artist, or an administrator, not an artist. Old prejudices against one whose class, color, or gender position leads to servicing rather than executive work still prevail. 2013, Angela Dimitrikaki, who's a, a... Well, let's call her a Euro. She's a Greek uh, art historian and novelist who's based in Edinburgh. uh, 2013. If women's art today privileges a consciousness directed at the experience of transience, of cross, of journeys, this becomes more pronounced when art becomes explicitly geared towards the extraction of knowledge from rather than experimenting with social space. Strongly connected with a perceived documentary turn in visual aesthetics, such art has been viewed implicitly at least as a form of critical and, according to some, also collective pedagogy. The bottom bit just says, working with me for about four decades. Are you managing to read this and listen to me and stay awake? No. So I don't need to tell you what it says, do I? Okay, fine. Can you actually physically read it from where you are? Physically you can. Okay, just, just checking. Whole swathes of institutional intervention, temporally, culturally, and geographically specific, like British community arts in the 1970s and 80s, or British gallery education from the 1970s and into the 21st century, are dismissed without investigation apparently outside the etiquette of good art. 
David Cashman and Roger Fagan's pioneering work at Islington's Laycock School has disappeared, but in 1977 they recognized the multiple labors in their total work as artists who were creating projects with school students. 2014, Eddie, Eddie Chambers on Barbara Walker, on the, the British artist Barbara Walker. Um, the resulting work was a series of portraits of her son or drawn views of her neighborhood, rendered on large, enlarged copies of stop and search carbon copies with which he had been issued at the end of each encounter with the police. Hmm. This bit's not working. <coughs> Sorry. Care Short's career, risk taking, that's very clever if you see it written down, by the way, because care lit. So care, let me just spell that out because I really like it. Care Short's career, I've got shorts rather than shortens. So shorts is what you talk when you have an electrical failure, it's shorts. And care literally is a shortened version of career. You take the last two word, letters off. Anyway, I just want you to appreciate the, the joy of it. Care Short's career. Risk-taking is celebrated as a special quality in artistic practice, but conventionally limited in application to heroic gestures from the studio or the street. The significant risk to her artistic identity a woman takes by having her family, or when she takes a full-time job to avoid domestic collapse, go unrecognized as risk-taking artistic labor, which draws on the performative, the effective, and the entrepreneurial. Uh, and this is a British artist called Ryan Gander, who some of you might know, um, said in 2006, the Fishlian vice practice is a trajectory or a path that one could marvel at, swerving madly, but not out of control, considered but swift, valiant and stealthy. This path that they present, the spectator can't always easily follow, never quite being able to understand how one work arrived directly after another. Their steps forward are on their own terms, terms only they can understand. I wish I had their ability to turn my hand to anything, ideas in front of me and nothing but art history behind. The reason... I, anyway, I, I can do more spelling out, but I won't. It's all right. Um, Shifting from the pre-digital into the continuously changing digital era of work, this uh, picks up on what you were saying, um, has significantly greater consequences for marginalized artists. Breaks in a linear development of my career mean that my re-entries are marked by an urgent need to acquire additional understanding, knowledge, and equipment, as well as to reorientate my modes of promoting and archiving my work. 2016, Roshini Kempadu, who's a, a black British artist, from the, there's a group of people who I've been quoting from who are sort of known as a group of artists who are generally called black British artists of, from the 1980s. They, they, they kind of emerged in the 1980s. Um, 2016, I propose that this expanded pictorial Caribbean archive is a contiguous Caribbean archive the term contiguous signifies a physical and metaphorical construct created and emanating from the interrelationships made between visual cultural forms, spaces, and language. The contiguous Caribbean archive is thus heterogeneous and contradictory, and not just the preserve of a single individual, state institution, or private company. The contiguous archive relates to and arises from materials being explored in close proximity to each other, as a joining and interlinked, a kind of symbolic touching or contact between materials. Table. Younger gen... Oh, this is... Sorry. 
Yeah, you've got table there. Younger generations can't read her. She speaks a, a different language. 1988, Denise Riley. I'd argue that it is... Com Sorry, I'm having problems here. I'd argue that it is compatible to suggest that women, in quotes, don't exist while maintaining a politics of, in quotes, as if they existed, since the world behaves as if they un unambiguously do, did. To translate, our talk necessarily contains the pedagogic. It is both overly and inadequately didactic. It is not sexy. We have to know much more while being understood to know much less. 2008, Alexandra Kokoli, who is, um, uh, again, a Greek art historian based in Britain um, and who was very helpful to me in thinking through some of this work. Feminism makes a particularly slippery subject for historiography, even for the writing of its own histories, since it is un under an ongoing process of redefinition that involves a constant self decentering That's the last in that. Um, I realized as I read it, you might wonder what it's got to do with work. Um, I don't know whether you do, but I hope that the use of the word deserver and the idea of an artist's work and the spillovers and the crossovers um, helps to think about artistic labor. Thank you. Thank you. So they've been working on this project at Nottingham Contemporary, which um, is, I think, the fourth project that they've done since 2013. Um, using the body as a research tool within the architecture of the gallery space. So thinking about the gallery as a workplace um, rather than solely as a sort of public exhibition space, but looking behind the scenes and through the building to see how the gallery space functions as a workspace and with the body as a form of research tool. Is that fair? Yes. Yeah, Over to Jenny. Sounds good. Thanks, Kirsty. You can hear me okay? Is that yeah. Um, we probably haven't got time, but I was... I feel like... A <laughs> is everyone still okay with uh, carrying on? Or do people need to stand up a bit or something? Okay. Um, so, um, thanks so much, um, Christine, Ben, Marina, Dave, uh, for um, and everyone else for the invitation um, and thank you all for um, bearing with this last presentation and then we can get on to hopefully having some good discussion together um, yeah I'm going to talk as Kirsten said I'm going to talk about um, this project that uh, manual labors have been working on called Building as Body. There's a few um, copies here. I don't know if people um, have picked them up and want to take a look at them while, we're, while, while I'm chatting. It's really weird speaking. Uh, yeah, can, yeah, oh, brilliant. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, yeah, it's quite strange not being, uh, speaking without Sophie. Um, so yeah, so I'm one half of, of Manual Labours and we've been working since 2013. And we've carried out research in different fields of work, including uh, with call centre workers, uh, with people working in student complaints, uh, in universities, with commuters and with <coughs> cultural workers. And the research process and the methodology has included workshops, meetings, interviews, uh, film screenings, writings, um, Artist commissions, where artists have uh, responded to some of the research we've been gathering, uh, journal articles and design objects. And 
sort of each phase of the research culminates in this in a published manual. Um, so today I'm going to uh, introduce this um, and share with you some parts of this latest project, um, Building as Body. Um, a handbook for investigating your workplace. Um, and this is developed from a two-year residency at a public art space called Nottingham Contemporary in the UK, um, where we've worked um, together with staff to explore the architecture of the workplace. Um, so the building as body looks into different ways in which buildings and bodies are fluid ecosystems which affect each other. And we've been trying to map how the circulatory, the digestive, and the social reproductive systems operate in the cultural institution. So what, building, uh, what symptoms does a building suffer with? What ways can we diagnose and challenge the conditions that perpetuate them? Um, and it is, it's important to say that this is very much a work in progress. So um, this is like one moment within the, the research process that um, um, I'm sharing together with you here. Um, and, and I suppose maybe we're at this point in the research process where we're now having these public um, sharings of some of what we've gathered and discussed together. Um, and so I think, yeah, it'll be really interesting to to think through um, maybe some of the commonalities, but also the differences of um, what we've been discussing here in the manual from the UK perspective to how things operate here in Sweden. Um, and maybe I'll just also mention that, um, so, so from this project so far, there's been kind of three different works that have been produced. So there's been uh, this manual here, um, there's uh, something called the Wandering Womb, which is a mobile staff room and kitchen that we've developed together with staff at Nottingham Contemporary. Um, and there's also a performance called The Complaining Body, which gallery assistants at the institution have developed um, together, which has been performed there. Um, but today I'm just going to talk about uh, this book, and I'll mention The Wandering Womb at the end as well. Um, and I should just say also behind me are just slides. I, they should just be rolling, hopefully. That's the wandering womb there. Um, so they're just to kind of, um, yeah, maybe help visualize some of the ways um, we've been working so far um, and some of the images from the, the building we've been working in. Um, so I'm going to talk about... Um, kind of the context of the investigation at Nottingham Contemporary, uh, the methodology we use, um, building as body, this metaphor that we use and why that's been useful, um, the different body systems that have come to light through the collective investigations, and then I'll finish up talking a little bit about this mobile kitchen, staff room, the wandering room. Um, so if some of you are, are looking at this, the idea is that you would maybe find this um, in your staff handbook or in a staff room, if indeed you have one. Um, maybe it's something that you would take home to discuss with friends and colleagues about working conditions. Maybe it's something to be used at union workshops, sort of share in your community center, or something potentially to email to your boss um, or the agency staff who work in your workplace to encourage collective conversations about work. And so all the content in the manual is gathered from the work we've been doing with staff. Um, and basically, Sophie and I have then developed um, collectively um, a sort of editing process, which transforms some of these conversations and statements into scripts um, and conversations and imagery, which you'll see throughout the manual. Um, Sophie and I uh, don't have Photoshop, so it's literally been made manually with like acetates, which then we've worked with this amazing designer, Saria uh, Gregorio, who has, has then put it together into this manual. Um, and as you'll go through, maybe you'll see some pages. Any page of the border is basically, um, it says workshop on it. Um, so that's something hopefully then that can be translated and tested and tried 
in different spaces of work. Um, and and so the perspective from how what this manual's um, discussing from it from is the perspective of the building body. Um, and um, and I'm going to be a kind of like vessel for this building body's voice today. Um, so I'm going to read from from the building body's perspective. Um, um, so over the last two years, between 2016 and 2018, I have undergone a series of investigative procedures by manual labours and staff who have worked within me. We have built collective tools through workshops, performances, presentations and collages to help us explore and investigate how I function, what my ailments might be and how these have an effect on the people who work in me and in turn how they are affecting me. The focus of the procedure has been my internal operations, so rather than my exterior public-facing aspects. This is an important change because as a public art organisation, most of my energy is spent on keeping up my public profile and providing a service for those around me. Following this scrutiny of my inner workings, Manual Labours has produced this manual so that other building bodies could undergo a process of examination led by the staff who work within them. So whilst I function as a publicly funded art centre, this manual hopes to share methods and findings that can be of use to all sectors and workplaces, from small organisations to bigger institutions. So I, um, my building body, grow up in an area called the Lace Market, which is an area that used to be dedicated to machine-made lace, which was one of the main industries in Nottingham in the 19th century. A legacy that inspired my architects to imprint lacework on my outer skin. Now, luxury apartments, offices and cultural institutions, such as myself, form a new layer of employment in the city, forming part of the city-led um, creative quarter. As with the physical effects of the lace making on the hands, back and eyes of those who operated the machines, dyed the lace and mended the lace, what suffering and physical imprint does the work necessary to run a cultural organisation have on bodies and the environments they occupy today? Just as the success of the lace industry was connected to a whole network of exploitation and colonial rule, what kind of labour and exploitation is the cultural sector reliant on? What effect does work have on bodies at all levels of my organising and production? So my uh, exploration has been underpinned by feminist architecture theory, social reproduction and sick building theory, and this has informed the collective me methods for checkups, health investigations, mappings and examinations beneath my surface and skin. Michelle Murphy... Um, uh, a theorist who um, explores the idea of sick building syndrome and its link to the women's office workers movement in the US. In the office workplace, unlike the factory, disease or illness has to be proved rather than believed. There was no disease as such associated with office work. Thus, the women office workers movement had to offer an alternative version of how workplaces might affect bodies. So taking inspiration from Murphy's work, manual labours and staff have been exploring me in how the physical environment contributes to the subjectivities of staff who work within my walls. How does the commercial hiring of meeting rooms, overflowing cupboards and heavy fire doors make staff feel, behave and relate to each other? And how and why are staff complicit in reproducing the conditions that are the source of their own complaints? Um, in connection to the metaphor, the building as the body, it's allowed me to be explored in new ways, offering a different language of how to speak of my ills. The feminist Audre Lorde encourages that we must find new languages to undergo a forms of institutional analysis. So here the metaphor provides a productive poetry that enables the workers within me to share their feelings and experiences that haven't yet had a public space to breathe. And the metaphor of the body does not mean that I conform to the normative idea of a human body, 
often an able-bodied male, white, slim, healthy. Rather, my body is assembled and contingent upon the parts of the body that are under investigation and who is helping the exploration. For example, some parts of my body may appear healthy to some workers, but under closer scrutiny, there are some underlying problems, while other parts of the body are living with chronic ongoing pain. The architect and writer Jennifer Bloomer describes how the metaphor of the body has persisted as a ruling paradigm throughout the history of Western architecture, but generally this has involved the image or figure of the white male body, not an analogue of the body as a messy assemblage of flows, both material and immaterial. Bloomer, along with other feminist perspectives on buildings as bodies, discusses the importance of the fluid interplay between the building body and the experiences of occupying and using them. These examinations critique the building as body at all levels, not losing sight of the structural inequalities on which institutions are originally built. So who are these institutions built for and why? And which bodies are employ employed in these spaces and how much is their work valued and visible? So the metaphor um, has developed from a process which Manuel Labors has been working on with staff, as well as being influenced from the previous Manuel Labors project entitled The Complaining Body, in which the artist Sarah Blau Brown discussed how she felt that her workplace complaints were silenced or not heard, but instead expressed through the illness of the physical building she worked in. This could be seen in like dripping taps, broken coffee machines, um, cracks in the wall. Another woman involved in that project also discussed how she tried to describe her headache pain to a doctor who refused to believe she was suffering. So the patriarchal emphasis on rational, authoritative language can make us feel stupid, deaf and blind to other forms of expression and experience. So the metaphor hopes to find a different way for people to express their relationship to the building without jeopardising their own job or offending other colleagues. The hope is that the fictional space of the building as body and its organs offer a parallel world in which working complaints can be digested, circulated and excreted differently. And of course, the metaphor is not without its own problems. For example, what is the critique of the patriarchal doctor-patient relation um, if, as artist researchers, manual labours adopts the role of lead physicians? How does this reflect the collective nature of our investigations with, to the staff who we, to whom we are indebted? Um, and now I'll talk a little bit about... Um, some of the findings that are within this book, which is located around a series of chapters. So central to the investigations within the book has been the mapping of body systems onto the building. Um, in order to understand the different ways I currently work and those parts of me that don't work. Um, so the first chapter starts with a series of exercises um, so you can help get to know the building or the workplace that you're working in, if you're going to be using it, and the different actors that are working within it. Um, so to delve deeper into identifying uh, problematic areas, blockages, um, there's a number of checkups that we performed um, on different body systems. Um, sorry, a number of checkups we performed to, ana to be able to find different body systems in the building and then being able to diagnose problems and proposals for remedies. So through these initial investigations, there was like three um, systems that came up as areas that needed more rigorous study. And these were the circulatory, the digestive, and the social reproductive. So the circulatory system, um, which you'll see in the book there, is where we get to know um, the staff and the overlapping throws between the structure of the organization and the roles people play. Um, it looks at the different working conditions between staff, both material and physical, um, and how this has affected the fluid circulation um, within the organization. And this chapter really listens closely to gallery assistants who are um, working uh, within the galleries looking after the art. Um, and they, most, all of them pretty much operate on a zero hour contract. Um, but at the same time must have to move through the whole of the organisation um, and encounter many blockages in this work. Uh, the following section looks at the digestive system, 
Uh, so this is a really um, strong area of discomfort uh, for the building. And this um, focuses on the uh, space of the open office, um, the basement and the storage. And we investigated these areas through doing a series of architectural endoscopies, um, which offered a method for getting into the um, behind-the-scenes area that most of the public would never see or maybe even think about when you go and visit a gallery exhibition. Um, and then the, the chapter after that looks at the social reproductive system. And this is like maybe the most key area of struggle, um, as highlighted by the staff. Um, and this chapter begins by identifying where my social reproductive organs are, followed by um, a hysteroscopy, um, a discussion um, on the period pains that I'm suffering with, and a discussion with the original architect. And um, I suppose it's important to say that um, the social reproductive struggles are not about the possibilities the building has to conceive or bear offspring, or bear offspring but rather about the social reproduction. So that's to say all the backstage work that enables the gallery to open the doors to the visitors, um, put on public events, uh, provide visitors with a safe, welcoming space to learn, experience and engage. And um, whilst in this book um, you might notice that the social reproductive system represents that of a biologically identified female, um, we've really tried to resist um, the body um, identifying as woman. Um, so rather the biological traits of the female reproductive system, including like the vagina, the womb, ovaries, are explored as spaces in resistance to the historical dominant patriarchal relation between the male anatomy and architecture. So just as the heart and the brain are not explored in this partial study and manual, um, rather what's presented here is a queer collection of organs revealing different working conditions and power structures. And then the final chapter looks at some collective um, remedies um, in how we can um, treat or think through ways in which we could change the workplace. These include a health assessment of the workplace that you could go to your board, a colonoscopy, um, and as well as a ways to support the growth of the social reproductive system. So this is where we propose the making of a wandering room, mobile staff room and kitchen. Um, and I'll maybe just mention a, a couple of um, things about that. Um, so, um, so this idea of um, not having space for the staff to be able to um, take care of themselves, eat, rest, chat, socialize, um, relax, um, all these um, parts of a day that are very necessary in being able to do your work um, came up as a really key issue in this workplace. Um, and so the idea of making a mobile um, staff room and kitchen was a way of providing a space for distributing and discussing uh, social reproduction at work, as well as a way of um, coming together and being able to occupy space um, for these necessary labours. So the, the title of The Wandering Womb comes from this um, idea um, that was uh, pathologized by ancient Greek scholars who thought that women's illnesses such as hysteria was caused by the women's womb sort of wandering around the body. And so as a cure, doctors would put sweet smells at the vagina and like horrid smells at the nose in order to kind of lure the womb back into its sort of rightful position. Um, and obviously a really good cure for this was um, to remain pregnant um, so that the womb's sort of tethered in its rightful place. So we thought that this wandering womb metaphor um, and the womb as a space of kind of care, circulation, rejuvenation was really interesting way of exploring social reproduction at work um, and how to relate the physical um, and mental health of workers with the spaces for rep social reproduction like the toilet, the staff room, the kitchen, the storeroom. Um, so what happens when these spaces of social reproduction are neglected and what kinds of spaces of socialization and community can they produce when they're brought into focus? Um, and I suppose the fact that the wandering womb is mobile and can move around the organization from the kind of behind the scenes area into like the main gallery spaces um, sees um, uh, this wandering womb, as did the ancient Greeks, I suppose, as an instrument of disruption to like the current norms and patriarchal hierarchy. Um, 
And I suppose it also speaks to one of our methods that when we're developing works that come out of this research that although they may be seen as aesthetic objects, they're also meant to be used and become kind of these provocations within the workplace. Um, and and what we, Sophie and I are kind of interested in is how, how this connects to social reproduction theory, which questions how and who maintains the workers so they are able to continue to work. And within social reproduction theory, theory there's off, the focus is often on the domestic and private spheres of care needed to produce a healthy and efficient workforce. Um, so th with, um, I suppose, in the context of um, a crisis of social reproduction, where it's um, very difficult for many to even uh, have the tools to re and the time to reproduce themselves, and the fact that we're um, extending the time that we're working all the time, it feels like the workplace is an equally crucial space um, to discuss social reproduction and the maintenance and care of the worker. And, and one thing we're interested in looking at is, of course, this isn't. With, it's, it's, this has been something that um, different workplaces have looked at in different ways and for different reasons, from kind of um, the Bourneville factory or Marabou Park Inn, where I used to work in uh, Stockholm, that looked at incorporating um, uh, spaces and support for social reproduction in order to produce an even better workforce to then um, like Google and Facebook offices of today, which even um, have the perk of um, freezing of women's eggs as a way in which they could uh, climb the career ladder even quicker. Um, so this is something that, uh, that will be the basis of a, of a paper that we're going to be writing. Um, and I suppose like um, maybe just to end on that, whilst I suppose what our analysis, I suppose, within this together with staff suggests is that even if the purpose of the building, which in this case is a cultural space, is to offer like health, education, cultural benefits to its visiting audiences, it's often reliant and um, dependent on the deteriorating health of the bodies that actually work inside it. So following the architect Diane Agrest notion that architecture is predicated on sexist, racist and classist regimes, is it possible to accept that all buildings are already in a state of sickness that is spread to the bodies of the workers inside them? And if we collectively can begin from there, it might be possible to discuss ways to change them. Um, so that I'll probably end there. Um, and um, just to say that um, I have a bunch of these here today. Um, it's also available free online and it'll be on the website. And if you can't wait till then, you can get it off our website. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and I suppose these they they are available today. So and I suppose there's a really small print run because we never have very much budget to produce these projects. So um, the idea is that it goes somewhere that it would get used. So if you have a staff room. Most people maybe don't even have a staff room. If it's your home office and a place for sort of discussing some of the ideas um, and it could be useful, then it would be really, just let me know and it'd be really great to take it away. Thank you, Jenny. Thanks. Thanks. Um, could I just invite um, our speakers up to, we, we have still some time till six o'clock um, where we can open up to have more of a conversation together. Um, so could I invite Felicity Allen and Karen Hansen, who both spoke earlier, along with Jenny, and also Winnie Herbstein, who's an artist who presented work in the screening programme, also a member of a feminist welding collective. Um, and Bjorn, also from the screening programme, if you'd like to join us. And... Our colleague from the editorial board, Marina Vishmit. We put everyone in the middle. You can come forwards and take some seats if you want to get closer.
so yeah, from the from our left, Bjorn, Winnie, Felicity, Karen, Jenny, and Marina. Um, hi. Okay. So, um, how much uh, how much time do we do we actually have? Okay. So that's that's not very much. I do have a few questions, but maybe I'll keep them if there's sort of a lull in the audience, because obviously you've been here for a long time, and you might have comments and questions that have accumulated in that time. So, if I could open it up immediately uh, to to those. It was just uh, during your presentation I was thinking about the wages for housework uh, movement which happened in the 1970s in, in Europe um, and uh, there was a call for um, a recognition of what was traditionally uh, women's, women's labour um, which had been uh, disregarded for so long and the idea that housework supports like a, a, a capitalist system but it's unpaid and invisible um, and I was just thinking about that campaign which obviously uh, didn't happen and, and like the kind of the labor of the the mother or the, or the woman in relation to like how we perceive artists um, the labor of, uh, of artists there was that slide that you had that had the kind of um, w what makes an artist a perfect worker and I thought maybe there were like direct parallels there also to like to, to women's labor or Sorry, I want to introduce Marina at this point because I've just been reading the article that you wrote in Third Text where you're talking about the wages for housework movement and you, you talk about the two different types of analysis which I, which I thought would be really interesting to hear something about. Um, should, do you want to... Uh, yeah, that was kind of just maybe laying out two kinds of reproduction, two notions of social reproduction we can use to think about art in relation to ideas around social reproduction and feminism. So one is the one that Winnie was just talking about, like the kind of social reproduction feminism, social reproduction theory, which of which the kind of wages for housework movement is one of the maybe most kind of infor informing moments, I guess in terms of how kind of care work, domestic work is valued, how it reproduces labor power, what was mentioned by Jenny just now. So there's that side and the other side, I was just kind of thinking about a sort of more totalizing and abstract understanding of reproduction as you get in kind of um, Louis Althusser, for example. So the idea of the reproduction of the relations of production. And I think there's overlap between those two forms of analysis, but I think they kind of, I guess I was arguing we need to keep both of them in mind so we don't kind of end up maybe perhaps valorizing one against the other or isolating rather one from the other so that one can become a sort of representative of something positive that we can affirm within capitalism. So I think that kind of relates to um, the point that Karen was making about whether the universal basic income or the artistic salary, the socialist critique, I think. So it's kind of like maybe 
there's there's that element like do we want to improve our situation within an existing system or do we want to perhaps mobilize aspects of that situation in order to question the system more comprehensively so that was just a bit of the kind of relation between those two I was trying to build but very interestingly in that issue there's a discussion of the wages for housework in the US among a kind of a black women's kind of wages for housework and that same issue on reproduction of third text which is like two issues ago I just wanted to add because I was really struck about the same thing same idea because I d I'm guessing you I don't know whether you n know about it and whether everybody here knows about it but I remember when I was young the um, the Netherlands were famous for paying artists a salary. Yeah. Yeah. You and I, I, exactly. That's what I thought. I, yeah. Yeah. I don't want to. Okay. To to say anything that you know about that. I, I, I don't know so much about it. Is anyone know? Uh, about the, the system in the Netherlands. And I just heard that there was some problem with it because um, you, know, you, you get paid for work and, and what was considered work was sort of defined as uh, artworks, uh, sort of objects. So you have to sort of submit an object and all those objects were stored somewhere. And you didn't really put your best work in there. But <laughs> so, so it's created like a huge bank of art objects that and the problem is when, when you, you define art beforehand and someone else, you know, you have, and, and then you have to fill in that space, that, that could happen. So that, that's why I think it's, you know, important if you have that type of system that you, it's, it's a dynamic system that you can sort of develop, yeah. I think it's very funny because what you just said is exactly what I've heard. Yes, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't have any sources. It's just gossip, so I, I would love to need someone that knows something more about it. Um, I would like to, I, I'm sorry, I'm a bit confused uh, with names, but did you uh, showing the work, the women's, um, it was that yours? Or? Yeah, because I, <laughs> no, I, uh, I sort of missed the sort of background of it. Um, just, can, can you tell a bit more about the, the um, project uh, so um, stud work that showed today um, I finished earlier this year um, and it was a project I suppose that kind of came out of previous works that I've been making and kind of thinking about um, gendered materials how when I worked with concrete or metal um, there was an idea that they were for particular bodies or kind of um, considered, like used in particular spaces. Um, and uh, I did a project working with a, with a girl racer who um, was kind of complaining about how people perceived her like, relationship to the car and kind of how it was considered more like a male domain or, or yeah. And so this project came out of, of that way of thinking, but also as like a genuine desire to find a way to support my artistic practice, like, um, out, outside of, you know, in other ways, isn't the service industry. So um, I trained at the this course at the local college in Glasgow, which is a woman in construction course that's been running there for quite a long time. Um, and it takes you through the basics like bricklaying, plastering, joinery, tiling. Uh, yeah, and um, through that I was kind of, I was also looking at... Um, you know, these movements that have been the kind of uh, feminist movements and also, I mean, you also spoke about like the Black British art movement that, um, and with that quote from Lubaina Hamid about how everything like disappears or kind of that erasure of things or kind of thinking that things last and then you realize that they don't and you look back at them with nostalgia. And I was kind of thinking about these ideas of like um, cycles of visibility and how when I began looking into like women in construction and the women in manual trades movement, like actually it was massive in the 1980s and the percentage of women working in the construction, construction industry 
was 1% then and it's also 1% today. And just thinking about like the amount of energy that went into like promoting like that trade in the 1980s and how like with so many movements it just like disappears and then it has to be refound again or something. So like this video in a way it kind of is linking like what I was doing now and the kind of groups that um, we were set up, uh, slag hammers in particular that we set up in Glasgow um, the welding group um, and kind of like courses that were running in the local like out from the local councils um, with kind of movements that were happening like in the past and so that that kind of like archival footage that comes into it along with uh, the text which was kind of brought together a lot of conversations that I had with women who were working who are either living in like feminist living spaces or working to build them in the 1980s and the kind of like collapse of those in some ways. Um, yeah, so that was quite a various things, but yeah, so that's how the film came together. Um, yes. Once again, please. Okay. I think mine was the second one. This. Uh, it's with me, and um, the background is black, and it's short, and it's uh, it's a lot of numbers. Mm -hmm. How many minutes or hours per day you spend doing all the things you're recommended to do. And in the end, we find out that there's not enough time to, to work. Yes, yes. Um, okay, some, well, newspapers, but also some are just estimations. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, but maybe I have some questions for you. Um, maybe it's a bit off topic, but um, um, in Sweden, the, um, there's a very segregated um, situation when it comes to work. I mean, gender-wise, some professions are almost exclusively um, occupied by women, and others almost ex ex exclusively uh, by men. And uh, I guess the situation is kind of similar in the UK. Um, why do you think it's like that in 2018? <laughs> okay, you can think about it and I ask you something in between. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to answer that question, but but I think, uh, well, I'll just talk about something else, maybe it relates to it, but in Glasgow recently there was um, a, a protest by council workers, um, and it was people who were in the roles of care workers, um, nursery workers, uh, um, cleaners, who were protesting the fact that they'd been overlooked um, for for eight years, basically, they've been kind of like fighting this, and they've been overlooked again and again for um, increases in in pay in those jobs. But at the same time, the jobs that were the street cleaners and the bin collectors were constant, were getting like rate like raises all the time. And like the thing that I find interesting about that is that, of course, there's a gender split with those jobs in the way that you're saying, you know, these some are occupied mainly by women in these roles that are kind of considered. Um, women's roles were the ones that were being overlooked for raises and just like the way in which like equal pay is kind of it's quite sinister in the way that it's that it, I don't know that it hap like that it happens um, but yeah
That's the more accurate uh, version of it, but I'd, yeah. Anyway. Okay. No, I, I, no, it's it's small. I hope. Okay, I, I found it really interesting, the concept um, about this oeuvre. Uh, but what prevents uh, this oeuvre from becoming an oeuvre? No, that's a lovely question. Thank you. And I'm very pleased you asked it because actually what I would, I think we should be aiming for is that an oeuvre becomes a disoeuvre. So an oeuvre, an oeuvre the way it's currently uh, conceived generally is that it is a form of a progressive linear development. Um, and it might have a bit of tailing off in the, at the end, and it might have a weak start or, or a strong start, and it might have ups and downs, but generally it's seen as progressive and total and the main work that an artist does, um, whether or not they do additional work. And they may do additional work, and it might be included, for instance, writing, on the whole, teaching hasn't been included, but there's a very nice article um, that came out, I think, in 2008 by Jan Ververt, which where he's talking about uh, Joseph Boyce. He's actually not really talking about this, so I'm coming at it very sort of side, side in and sweeping in kind of thing to take one bit, but what he's talking about is the way in which Joseph Boyce spoke and wrote about his own practice, his, his artwork. And what he's saying is that people are tremendously uncritical of his speaking um, and what he said. So they take it, but you know, they take it as read that somehow it's the truth. And what he's saying is that, you know, one should be as critical of his educational work, one should treat, sorry, one should treat his educational work and his writing or or speaking work as much as critically as one takes exhibitionary practice, and that helped me absolutely identify what I was thinking, which was that there were all sorts of ways in which I knew that my work. My, my looking back, I had been constantly working with basically exclusions and, and positioning, but also working with contingency. Um, and that actually there was piles of my work that a conventional art history would never consider to be work. But equally, if one takes the logic of the, of the say, let's say second wave feminist art, some of the second wave uh, feminist art historians, like for instance, Griselda Pollock and, and Rosie K. Parker, who basically used a kind of post-structuralist version of feminism to think through what a new art history might be, i.e. it would be relational, it was all the bits, art was all, it wasn't just the, the art object, it was all the other bits that were made of art as well, if you like, or that made art. And so therefore, it became clear to me, for instance, and I, I already knew this about a project that I had run when I was at Tate Britain, for instance, as an employee, that I had treated that particular project, not everything I did there, but that particular project, I had treated as a development of my own, of, of different forms of practice that I had previously made. And that I felt able to do it for a number of reasons, but including the fact that Tate, Britain, Tate was going through a very um, um, significant shift from what might have been seen as the 1950s public service, which was all about having anonymous people 
serving a public in some sense to something that was much more about individual entrepreneurial self-branding. And that although the, so the neoliberal institution allowed it for individual quirkiness, it might result in losing your job, but actually you could do that stuff while you were there. So I think the conditions of precarity and employment uh, have now become much more general. I mean, I mentioned the idea that labor is now feminized. So what, happened, what used to happen just to women now happens to everybody. And so therefore, there is much more potential for um, an Earth being a small part, a conventional Earth being a small part of a much bigger disearth. I was very long-winded there, sorry. <laughs> I wonder if maybe I could ask you to follow up on that and then maybe put a question to, to you too, Amy and Jenny. Um, so the way you've been talking about the deserve makes really makes me think of the Liz Rhodes text, Who's History? Mm -hmm. Do you know that one? Because <laughs> uh, she, she has this amazing phrase like, I prefer history in a pile at my feet rather than strung in a line over my head. You know that one? like one of our, because uh, I'm part of Cine Nova, it's like one of our kind of ongoing founding texts in a way. Um, so kind of thinking about this idea of unworking history or unworking the kind of the work of making history or looking at history, um, as well as the way that, as well as how you think about art practice, it's also the way you think about writing a history of that practice, right? So kind of putting the gaps and the weaknesses and contradictions, but also the huge like undisclosed and unknown relationalities of it, as you were doing in your presentation. So I was kind of thinking about putting those histories on display as a kind of, of necessity of feminist practice, but also as a way of kind of countering a certain maybe way of fetishizing feminism in the contemporary moment kind of thinking of this idea of like fandom or like the fan of feminism. Um, and Angela Dimitrikaki, I think, has also talked about this ideas of maybe kind of turning turning the past into a kind of appealing radical object. So I wonder about like these ideas of unworking, how you kind of put the contradictions on display in a way that speaks to the kind of limits, but also kind of possibilities of the present. So that's my question for you and for you guys. My question is infrastructure, right? Okay, so you're approaching kind of infrastructure from the side of construction and you're approaching it from the side of inhabitation. Both of you are thinking about gender and kind of body bodies from those aspects. And I guess, yeah, I was just curious to hear what you thought about the kind of resonance between those two different sides of infrastructure that you're that you're touching on, but also maybe the kind of different class relations of construction and habitation, the way it's emerged in the two projects. So. I'll try. <laughs> um, thanks, uh, Marina. I was also um, really interested in some of the connections also with uh, your work, Winnie. And um, maybe first to say, um, I suppose, like, um, I wanted to share a little bit about um, a kind of way into the project somehow that was very kind of, like, polyphonic, like, involved so many different people. And so the kind of, like, task of, like, inhabiting that infrastructure was, like, really difficult. Like, it's been a really... It's been an amazing, but also, like, a really... Uh, a real struggle. Um, and I think there's that still that question uh, floating of like, and we we talk about this in the in the book about um, um, the fact that it's been possible for us to like do this inquiry. Um, there's a lot of different power structures at play, allowing allowing that inhabitation of a certain apparatus to to happen. So one is that we at the time, although she doesn't work there anymore, we were invited by. Um, uh, a, a manager 
um, who, who was the manager of the public programs, um, which is also a kind of wing of the organization that's funded by uh, the universities. So it has a, allows a bit more risk to happen. Um, and, um, and then what happened was, whilst all of the workshops and the ways in which we were investigating was open to the whole kind of staff structure, so you could talk, think of that as a class kind of system, the um, people really who were involved in the research were people on the kind of lowest wages. None of the managerial staff took part, which I think also paints a certain picture about how much the institution... Um, yeah, I mean, there's different reasons why they might not have not taken part. Let's not make assumptions. Um, and uh, and um, and so then, in a way, what what you get here is a kind of like looking up the kind of hierarchy of the the culture and institution. And um, and whilst we have been supported in different ways from people in different job roles with different privileges, um, that kind of yeah, I suppose the I, I really um, connected with what you said, Felicity, around the um, those, I suppose, maybe working in the margins or not in those kind of central worlds are the ones who are actually doing the predominant, uh, like the institutional and the social and the care labor for that institution. Um, so maybe that speaks to class a little bit. And, and I suppose also, interestingly, actually, so to, um, out, um, from doing this project, there, there came these two artist commissions. So one, the Wandering Womb, the mobile um, staff room and kitchen, and the other, the um, uh, performance with the gallery assistants. And um, uh, Effie Harley and Finn Pryor, who built the kitchen with us, um, Effie is one of the technicians at the um, gallery space. So, yeah, so they're, but they're also, of course, artists. So it was a really interesting um, thing way of kind of um, also hovering between these two kind of like um, identities that um, these workers um, had. So um, I suppose in a way thinking through how this project could allow people to be seen as artists and not only um, uh, uh, workers within uh, within the art space. Um, and, um, and I suppose this kind of gendering of that um, um, around technician work, which is how Effie sort of has worked in the organization, as well as every other role in the organization, which is also really interesting. Um, uh, she's actually doing a, a part of, uh, a section of research now on um, women in, uh, tech workers, which I was thinking was really interesting in relationship to what you're investigating um, and how to... Um, yeah, I suppose how to contextualize that in a wider um, um, mode of thinking around feminized labor, I was thinking, um, and the different kind of um, skills, precarities, and relations that are involved in that when you're thinking through women working um, in kind of trade labor or traditionally um, male labor. Okay, I don't know if that... Yeah, I um, I, I was kind of, um, before I came, I was looking uh, through the previous work that you guys had done, and I felt like there were quite a lot of um, links or kind of similarities, but also, um, I don't know, I suppose one of the questions that came up, uh, or one of the things that came up a lot in the project that I was, that I made was kind of this question of like, who builds the house and who builds the home, and the kind of... Um, who builds the exterior and the physicality of the space and then who like you know decorates the interior and i suppose what your project does is kind of like pulls out like the interior as well and kind of like makes it like visible and it it moves it away it's not talking about the domestic space in there it's talking about the kind of um like the the office space or the workspace so i thought it was kind of how that question um like doesn't work somehow in, in, in speaking about where, where, like in speaking about kind of office space, but at the same time, you know, you're thinking about like um, uh, architects being, tr traditionally it's kind of a white male role, or if not, then the language is still like descended from, from kind of a white male vernacular or something. Um, and uh, at the same time, it's built predominantly, I mean, in, in Scotland by like white working class or kind of working class males. And so like, the kind of space, the idea of like the spaces that we inhabit, kind of 
being designed and then built by uh, by men. I don't know. I think there's something within that. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't directly kind of like um, yeah. I don't know. Maybe it does directly respond. But also, I suppose uh, um, when you were speaking about kind of like illnesses or um, like related to work that were caused by the building itself. And I was then thinking about the process of learning and the skills that I picked up and the way that my body changed during that process. And then thinking about, um, uh, you know, like muscles and how like muscles grow when you're like learning particular trades and how like the people constructing those buildings have like a particular body or have like, you know, plasterers in particular, you know, have really strong upper arms because it's like you have to hold the, the board and like get it all up. And, and so I was thinking about the bodies in the kind of first instance of making the space, of the workers in the first instance, and then this second wave of bodies and how they're impacted by like the architecture and like the building decisions. Um, so I suppose there's something in that. Maybe we can talk about that later as well. But yeah, anyway, your turn. <laughs> Sam, um, <clears throat> I need to clarify, I think, what you were asking. I don't know whether you want to take this back again. I think what I was very confusedly articulating was kind of like the way you're kind of talking about historicizing certain practices so that they don't become kind of easily consumable objects because, you know, also due to kind of the particularities of women's participation in art, it's a kind of broken object in a sense. So I guess I was comparing that to also historic, like making a historical object, which will also be kind of broken and incomplete. And so how that informs the way we can act in the present, I guess. I think it's impossible to answer, actually. I mean, I think it's a great question. I think it's a really brilliant question. I, I don't know. Really, I don't know. And I think that, I mean, I'm thinking about the ways in which, so for instance, doing the number of variations on this work is a way of preventing it being realized in some sense or or you know it's it's kind of trying to offer a an inconsequential continuity in some sense you know so by having multiplicities it makes it inconsequential but at the same time it's a it's a it's a continuity which is an arabesque rather than a line, if you like. So that's how, that's one of the, I often think about arabesques um, for that sort of reason. The, I mean, but also there's something else, um, which is the, and I don't know whether it fits, but it's something I hold with me, which is the kind of idea of working without, a, working alongside out of date ideas. And I don't know whether that really informs it, gives any kind of answer, but it's, it's something, for instance, in the presentation, in, in, the, in the ways in which I presented this work, I'm very conscious that it kind of, re it resembles a type of work that I haven't previously made, but it, to me, it recalls 70s feminist, the look of 70s feminist work. So I'm sort of, and I, and in, in other work that I do, I, I work with watercolor in a way, precisely because it, because it's refusing to. I, I I don't know. There's a way in which I'm refusing to. The negatives about watercolor, in a way, I'm, I, there's a kind of resistance to that. On the other hand. The quotation I had from Rashini Kempadu, which is all about the, the archive being uh, sort of the, the proximate archive in a way, the sense of the contact between things and the ways in which you, I mean, she's very purposely going a, a sort of from an artistic practice and working with other people and containing all these objects together. So in a sense, there is a kind of, question around visual culture rather than the art object, which helps there, I suppose. But I don't know whether any of that at all answers what you were asking, which I think is a 
you know, really interesting questions. Is there anybody else? It made me think a bit of the, you know, the documentary filmmaker or artist filmmaker Trinity Minha? Yes. And how she always kind of talked about um, not speaking about, but speaking nearby. Yeah. So, and in a way, how to do that with a history that you were, were yourself part of. And I think with these four voices really kind of maybe yeah. performs that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's interesting we, we sit here and, and we talk to the UK and Sweden and I, for me it's a, and we're talking about gender division. There's g gender divisions in both countries, sure, but they're different. And I'm, I'm uh, curious about how you, you actually have experience of both societies. Uh, how, how do you sort of, how do you understand, yeah, sorry, how do you understand these gender divisions uh, at work in, in comparison? How do you Yeah, I mean, I suppose one thing that's uh, a kind of interesting comparison with this, so I suppose the, m the main argument that came out um, from working with staff was that there's no space for social reproduction or um, resources for processes of social reproduction at work, where um, at the time I was working in a space um, called Marabu Park and that I've never worked in a gallery with so much like space for staff. So it's also like, um, <laughs> it was super luxurious. And I think, um, yeah, it would be interesting to think through, um, and this is, I suppose, what I need to do, but like the different um, attention to social reproduction at work and what kind of um, discipline and control that's developing through these different pr approaches. Um, so say, for example, yeah, I mean, Marble Parkin also has a history of this, like when it was set up as a, a, a factory, um, which was mainly occupied by women workers. Um, there was, uh, you know, childcare that was in the grounds of the park. Um, so that, so that, which, which obviously, you know, at the time connected to this kind of um, 19th century philanthropist, um, productive kind of capital ideas. Um, and so I think, um, I think it's interesting to think through um, how that relates um, in comparison to the UK where, um, you know, there's really no secret that there's absolutely no <laughs> provision or like care for um, uh, the worker in being able to, you know, even have a desk to come to work at um, or, you know, have a space for lunch but or a place to, to make lunch rather than, you know, just spend it in the cafe that's downstairs or out there. So um, it's it seems much more explicit in the UK, um, but um, yeah, I'm curious about actually um, what kind of maybe more subversive <laughs> modes are at play within the, the, the Swedish system somehow, um, if that answers it a little bit. Yeah. I mean, that's a good <laughs> Uh, so, I think maybe we can wrap up this very intense three and some hours, though. Huh? It's, um, yes, we are never off work, but we are taking a break now. Um, so, thank you all so much for sticking around till the end and past the end. Thank you.